with a spirit of silent prayer, reflection, and meditation. Lord, as we gather together and prepare to read your word, we are grateful for this opportunity to sing your praises, to lift our hearts to your throne of grace, to see your tender mercy in the faces of these children that got before us not long ago. Lord, as we gather together for worship, our hearts are heavy as we think about the Loa family and them saying goodbye to one so young, so unexpectedly. We pray for them, for your healing touch to be upon their story. God, as we open your word today, we pray that you would speak to us a message of your kingdom, your righteousness, your hope for our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. Seems like it's been quite a while since we've been in the book of Acts, but our story continues today. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 4, and as follows. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy. In that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. They paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And after seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. And when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, They sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you. Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity." And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Then when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. May God's blessing abide with us as we read his word together. I had a conversation a few weeks ago with my uncle, who's been following the 
Acts study online. He lives in the Corpus Christi area, but he's been following our study online. And I just want to pause, and it, who here is on our tech committee? Joe Alvarado, you're up there. I see you. Wave at us. All right. If you're in the front, you can see him up there a little bit. Anybody else on our tech committee? Maybe Gotro, Adam. Y'all just kind of do like this. Let us see. All right. We're so grateful for the work that you guys do. Let's give them a round of applause. My uncle that lives in the Corpus area is able to keep up with what's going on in our church because of what you guys are doing. I think it's just so cool that someone doesn't even have to live in our town to kind of be a part of our, our ministry. We, th there are so many opportunities because of you guys and the way you've updated our website. If you haven't looked at it lately, go on there and look at all the things that are on there. It's really neat. You, if you're too sick to come one Sunday, you can, you can on your computer, log on and kind of uh, see our messages being preached or, or look at all the other activities. Right now there's a cool video on there about the Appalachia Service Project that we've been talking a lot about. You can do that. Uh, some of our winter visitors, when you go back home, you'll be able to access what we're doing and be a part of what we're doing as a church simply because of the work these guys have put in, and we're very grateful of that. I was having a conversation with my uncle who's been following our ACT study online and, and, and he made some really interesting observations. He said, I've been in Baptist churches all of my life, but I've never before been a part of a, a, a serious study on the book of Acts. And he said, I find that really surprising because as Baptists, we talk a lot about evangelism and sharing our faith, and that's pretty much what the book of Acts is about. And yet, in my experience, it's a book that tends to be avoided a, a lot. And he asked me, why is that? And I have to admit that his question was pretty piercing to me, and, and I got back home, and I, I looked through my own files at my office, and I figured, I, I've been a pastor for about 15 years, and that equates to about 750 Sunday morning sermons, if you're keeping count, somewhere in that ballpark. And I looked back through my files, and prior to this study, I had preached on the book of Acts about five or six times out of that 750 Sunday morning sermon. And so I don't know why others avoid this book, but it was clear looking at my own body of work in terms of preaching that I haven't given this book nearly the attention that it deserves. I think of a lot of us, we're being honest with ourselves and with each other, we would admit that we tend to avoid Acts because it makes us a little anxious to read this book. Because what we find here is often so unexpected. Acts makes us feel a little anxious because there are so many stories here, like the one we read today that we read, and we just have a hard time getting a handle on it and understanding what we find here. In Acts, we find the Holy Spirit moving in ways that we can't predict, can't understand, and therefore have a hard time explaining. In passages like the one we read this morning, we meet the unpredictable, the wildly unpredictable Spirit of God. And that kind of meeting can be unsettling for a lot of us. While we might say and pray and sing, talking about how much we want God's Spirit to move among us, often what we're really saying is that we want God's Spirit to move in ways that are predictable and safe, ways we can understand, ways that fit with our comfortable ideas about life, faith, and theology and don't shake our life up too much. We tend to want a prepackaged God that isn't going to ask for too much from any of us. This morning I was kind of scrolling through Facebook before coming to church because I've been trying to fill the void that fantasy football has left in my life. That was usually a time when I could sign people off the waiver wire because I know you're all doing that while I'm preaching. And I don't have that opportunity while I'm preaching to sign people and so I, I tried to get ahead Fantasy football's been over, so I've been scrolling through the, the, the Facebook thing this morning, and, and Doug Jackson from the School of Christian Studies had this picture on there of uh, a toy Jesus that he saw at Half Price Books or somewhere, and, and it was on sale for $5.99, and it said, the title it, the, the, on the little box, it said, Posable Jesus. And then his comment that he put on there was, he said, uh, this is a ripoff because you can get a posable Jesus for free from pulpits all across our land today. I think that's what a lot of us want. We wouldn't say it out loud, but we want a Jesus that we can pose and mold and make 
in our own image, a Jesus that we can be comfortable with, who will kind of behave in ways that, that don't upset us too much. We want to tame God that isn't going to shake our lives up too much. We want a God that will take care of us when we're sick and provide for us when we're in need. But other than that, he can pretty much leave us alone. The problem we have with Acts is that that's not at all the God that Luke shows us. As we scan these lines and read of persecution, of half-breed converts who have a delayed experience of the manifestation of God's Spirit, and then we find a magician who's baptized and then tries to buy his way towards spiritual power, we find Jesus' words to Nicodemus ringing true in this story. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, and so it is for everyone who is born of the Spirit. In Acts, we encounter the wildly unpredictable Spirit of God who cannot be controlled, manipulated, tamed, or posed. This encounter with God's Spirit shows us that God often uses unexpected circumstances to accomplish His will. When we last look at, looked at Acts, we encountered the story of Stephen's stoning, his martyrdom. This event marked a turning point in the church's history. The church went from kind of a existence that wasn't really opposed that much other than some beatings and some imprisonments, but, but pretty limited persecution. And with the stoning of Stephen, we crossed the threshold into intense, unrelenting, brutal persecution. The way Luke describes the ravaging of the Christians suggests sadistic cruelty, something like a wild boar tearing apart its prey. The persecution got so intense that believers were scattered all over. And we almost expect the story to end there, saying something like, the church got off to a good start, it had a real bright beginning, but then persecution heated up and things pretty much fizzled. That's not at all what Luke says happened next. The message paraphrases the story this way. It says, forced to leave home base, the followers of Jesus all became missionaries. Wherever they were scattered, they preached the message about Jesus. No matter how hard their enemies tried, they could not silence the witness of these men and women who followed Jesus by faith. Even when they were scattered, the disciples, like Philip, the deacon-turned-evangelist, used that scattering as an opportunity to share the gospel everywhere they went. In the beginning of this tale of the good news of Christ church, Jesus had given the disciples a blueprint for worldwide evangelism. He said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And yet we discover when we read this story that the church might never have fulfilled that broad, that broad calling had it not been for the martyrdom of Stephen and the persecution that followed it and the scattering that occurred. Kent Hughes says, following the church through Acts is like following a wounded deer through the forest. You have to follow the trail of blood. Early church father Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Time and again, God took what the opponents of his kingdom intended for evil, and he used it for good. Isn't that just how God works? Isn't that just how the wildly unpredictable spirit of God tends to move, to use things like persecution, bloodshed, and displacement to spark great revival? Just when it seems like the Christian story will end in defeat, God has a way of bringing glory out of hardship. A friend was sharing me the, with me the other day a story of how twice he was passed over for a promotion that would have been rightfully his. He was more qualified than the people that got the jobs that he'd been passed over for. And each time he went home full of disappointment. But each time he prayed that God's will would be done. And he said God gave him opportunities to serve in, in the the old job that he had, even though he didn't want to be there anymore, he had opportunities to serve. 
And eventually God put him in the job that he wanted so badly, but that now that he's in that job, he could see how God's timing was perfect. God was preparing a place for him in that job and preparing him to witness in the workplace. I pray that I would maintain an attitude like that more often. So often when things don't go my way, I'm so quick to get frazzled and to doubt and to lack faith and get frustrated. And when life is kicking us around and people are treating us badly, it, it, it's so hard to remember, but it's so important to remember that the wildly unpredictable Spirit of God often uses circumstances just like that to advance God's kingdom, to accomplish God's will. Somehow God is a way of turning times of opposition and hardship and suffering into times of blessing for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. Philip and the other disciples who were scattered in this time of persecution show us that we just never can tell what kind of circumstances God's going to use to further his kingdom, and we also never can quite tell where and how God's going to work next. In Acts, we find God's wildly unpredictable spirit working in some pretty unexpected places. It would be hard to find or imagine a a less likely place to experience revival than the kingdom of Samaria. The Jews regarded the people in the territory of Samaria with deep hostility. The Samaritans had been in the land while the Jews were in exile, and there was all kinds of bad blood there. The Samaritans observed a form of Judaism, but it was modified significantly. There was no love loss between these two ethnic groups. And the division sometimes spilled over into acts of violence that were well known in both kingdoms. The Jews hated the Samaritans, considering them half-breed heretics who were neither Jew nor Gentile. The Jewish rabbi said, Let no man eat of the bread of the Samaritans, for he who eats their bread is as he who eats swine's flesh. Let's brush up on our Judaism a little bit. Swine's flesh... Not good, right? Jews are not big on bacon and ham and, and, and not good to say that if you eat a Samaritan's bread, it's like eating a slab of bacon. A rough, rough thing to say. A popular prayer in those days said, and Lord, do not remember the Samaritans in the resurrection. My friends, that is the sound of ethnic hatred. These folks hated the Samaritans and the feeling was mutual. It went both ways. Only God's wildly unpredictable spirit could see to it that the first group to respond to the gospel beyond Judaism would be these people from Samaria. God loves to work in the lives of unexpected people in unexpected places. Philip's Samaritan mission was a radical step toward a vision of the gospel that was free of nationalistic prejudice and geographical limitations. I think God's Spirit wants to give us that kind of vision for the gospel today. Our God wants to work in the poorest colonia in the Mid Valley for His glory. Our God wants to work in the hills of the Appalachian Mountains with a story that rings forth of the promises of His kingdom. Our God wants to work in the lives of addicts, people who've turned their backs on their families and friends, people who have been shunned by those around them. Our God can build family where discord, suspicion, division, and hatred have prevailed. God's Spirit can touch the life of that lost family member that you've prayed over for years. God can reach that co-worker who laughs at you when you invite him to church. And maybe this next invitation, this next opportunity will be the time that God cracks that heart with the good news of his kingdom. The Spirit can heal the most broken families, the most wounded relationships, the most lost souls, and shine light where there is darkness. God's wildly unpredictable Spirit often moves just like that in unexpected people, in unexpected places, and yes, in unexpected ways. Just when we think we've got God's ways all figured out. Luke reminds us that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts and the stories that he tells. I, I think this is one of the reasons that a lot of people shy away from this book because God tends to act in ways that are the opposite of the way we think God's supposed to act. And it makes us feel a little weird. 
When we think, for instance, about the experience of coming to Christ and receiving the Spirit, we tend to think of those things happening pretty much at the same time. I think if we were talking about the norm, we would say that that's how it is. And yet, in this story, there's a delay between the Samaritans coming to Christ and being baptized and receiving the Holy Spirit. They don't receive the Holy Spirit until Peter and John lay their hands on them. A revival occurs in Samaria because of the ministry of Philip, but it's not until later when Peter and John are sent from Jerusalem to check out the story and they lay hands on the Samaritan believers that the visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit comes. We don't know what that manifestation looked like. We don't know what it sounded like. But when John and Peter laid their hands on the Samaritan Christians, something like a Samaritan Pentecost happened. Luke isn't trying to give us a detailed theology about how the Spirit should work. He's telling us the story of how the Spirit did work. The Spirit is connected with becoming a Christian, but there's no real normative fashion for how that happens in the book of Acts. The Spirit is connected with becoming a Christian, but sometimes it's connected with the laying on of hands, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it precedes baptism, and sometimes it follows it. In Luke's story again and again, the Spirit blows where it will. Luke doesn't tell us why this delay in the Samaritans receiving the Holy Spirit took place, but it seems to have something to do with breaking down ethnic barriers between the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and these Samaritan believers. When the Jerusalem church heard about this new movement in Samaria, they sent two front office disciples to go check it out. John and and Peter. Peter and John got there and they were able to see for themselves how God was moving among the Samaritans through the ministry of Philip. And, And I find it really interesting that John got sent to be a part of this Samaritan coalition because you might remember from Luke's gospel story that there was a point where John and James offered to pray that fire would fall from heaven on the Samaritans. Not in a good way, right? Apparently, the Spirit had done a very radical thing in the heart of this one that Jesus had called a son of thunder. The Apostle John and Peter's involvement in the laying on of hands confirmed that these Samaritan believers were not second-class Christians. Their their kids weren't going to have to ride in the back of the bus on the way to youth camp. They were part of the same church, having the same spirit as the Jerusalem believers. Through this act, the Samaritan mission was given the stamp of approval by the mother church in Jerusalem. It was endorsed, received, and enthusiastically participated in by the whole church. God's Spirit seems to have moved in this unexpected way to show them and us God's desire for a church where there isn't more, any more of this Jew and Samaritan division. Where there's no Jew and Greek There's no slave, there's no free, there's no male or female for your one in Christ Jesus. The Samaritan revival reminds us that we can't outguess where God might work next and we need to get on board with whatever it is that God is doing. A number of years ago, while we were serving in another church, an older older woman from the community began coming to our church, participating in worship and We got to know her a little bit, and she came by to see me at the office one day, and she said, this is going to sound crazy to you, but every day I'll be out working in my garden, and it's as though I hear God's voice saying to me, you need to go to church and get baptized. And she said, I hear it again and again and again, and my response was, ma'am, if you feel like God is calling you to do something, I would suggest that you do it. A few weeks later, she was baptized in our church, and she said afterwards that it was as though heaven's peace washed over her. She became a full member in the church and continues to be one of the most active members in that church. God moved in her story in an unexpected way that seemed crazy to her, and through that movement, through her response to that movement, God changed the direction of her life and changed the story of a whole congregation. How might God be doing that same thing among us today? Who are the Samaritans in our story? 
Who are the untouchables where we live? What unexpected person or group of people might God be calling us to reach out to? Is God calling you to do something that seems crazy? Is God moving in your story in a way that seems totally unexpected? And is it making sense to you at all? Acts reminds us again and again that yes is always a good response to the movements of the wildly unpredictable Spirit of God. Just when we think we've gotten our minds around this story and we're ready to go home, we remember that we have to deal with this mysterious character named Simon. Simon was a famous magician who made his living and impressed the Samaritans with his bag of tricks. He, he was something like Oz from the Wizard of Oz stories or probably more like a Cudendero where we live in South Texas. The Samaritans were impressed with Simon until Philip came along and preached the gospel of Jesus, displaying the true power of the Spirit of God. Even Simon saw in Philip a power far greater than his own. And, and Luke tells us that Simon, at least on some level, believed and was baptized. When Peter and John arrived and laid their hands on the Samaritan believers, the Spirit fell upon them, and whatever that visible manifestation of the Spirit looked and sounded like, it impressed Simon, and it sparked an idea within Simon the magician, Simon the entrepreneur's heart. If he could get this power to lay hands on people and pass the power of the Spirit along to others, he could make a fortune. And so in a scene, something like the show Shark Tank, he pitched the idea to Peter and John. I've got this great money-making opportunity. What, what we'll do is I'll give you money, and you give me that ability to pass on the power of the Spirit, and, and, and I'll do that for money and move forward. It'll be great for all of us. I'll tithe more. It'll work out wonderful. Peter wasn't impressed with the offer. His response to Simon's request is paraphrased in the message. You'll have to blame Eugene Peterson for this French. He says, to hell with your money and you along with it. Why, that's unthinkable. Trying to buy God's gift, you'll never be part of what God is doing by striking bargains and offering bribes. Change your ways and now ask the master to forgive you for trying to use God to make money I can see that this is an old habit with you. You reek with money lost. Ouch. Peter, tell us what you really think. It's a little hard to pick up on it from this language. This interesting story is the origin of the word simony, which refers to the attempt to buy spiritual office status or power, and we might broaden that definition to cover any attempt to manipulate God for personal gain. Kent Hughes describes it this way. He says, we would be wrong to suppose that this doesn't apply to us simply because we've never offered money in exchange for spiritual power. He says, Simon tried to obtain spiritual power in order to promote himself. And anytime we seek spiritual power or abilities to put ourselves forward, we make the same error. Preaching to gain recognition or status is simony. Serving with an eye to advancement in the church's power structure is simony. Seeking spiritual gifts for the promotion of oneself is simony. And yes, even seeking to be godly so that others will think we are godly is simony. When thought about in such terms, we see a little more of ourselves, I think, in Simon than we care to admit. This story is an invitation to do just that, to search our hearts and to be careful that we are responding to God's Spirit with much more than a what's-in-it-for-me approach. I think the most interesting part of this story for me is that Luke really doesn't resolve any of this for us. It's pretty typical for him. He gives us a story and then he doesn't really sort it out for us. We don't know if Simon was a real believer or if he was just going through the motions of faith. There are clues in this text that could lead either way. We don't know if Simon repented or wandered further and further away from the truth and started a heresy, as many traditions suggest. In the text, he certainly didn't repent. He has kind of a lame response. He asks Peter to pray to God for him that he won't be judged. 
We don't know. We don't know how Simon's story ended, frankly, because Luke isn't concerned with how Simon's story ended. He's inviting us to participate in this story ourselves. The question isn't whether or not Simon was a true believer, but whether or not we are responding to the gospel with true faith, true belief, true trust and commitment. The question is not if Simon truly repented, but whether or not we will repent of the ways in which we are guilty of trying to manipulate God in order to promote ourselves. Are we looking for a God that is safe, prepackaged, and tamed? Are we looking for a posable Jesus that we can buy for $5.99? Or are we ready for the indescribable power of the Holy Spirit to be unleashed in our midst? As we let this good news of Christ's church read us, are we looking for a God we can understand, relate to, and dare I say, even control? Or are we ready to surrender control of our lives and let ourselves be blown by the mighty rushing wind of the wildly unpredictable Spirit of God? This morning, we're going to sing an invitation song. And as we prepare to sing, I, I want to extend an invitation to everyone who's here. It may be that as you read this story, you read it and, and you think to yourself, this Simon character wasn't a real believer. I know it. I know the answer. He's not a real believer. And the reason that I know that is because I've seen my own heart. And I've fooled a lot of people for a long time. I, I've fooled my mom. I've fooled my grandma. I fool my kids, I fool my spouse. They all think I'm pretty well right with God. But when it gets real quiet, I know that I know that all is not well within my own soul. But you want to leave this place in a different state than where you are right now. Right now you look at Simon and you say, this guy was just hanging on to the fringes of the faith because he wanted to be around these faithful people, but he wasn't really one of them. And I feel the same way. This morning you can come and you can surrender control of your life. You can do what Simon didn't do in this passage. You can say, you know what? I'm all in. I'm going to jump in with both feet. God, you can have it all. You can have my desire. You can have, you can have my desire for stuff. You can have my desire for possessions. You can have my career path. You can have everything. I just want to be all in. I want to be wherever your spirit is leading. You can come this morning. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ with an authentic faith. You come. Maybe today you read this story and you would say, you know what? I think Simon was a believer but he was just easily falling back in to those patterns of life that he knew before he came to Christ. And the way you know that, the way you think that, is because you see it in yourself. And you know that you've given your heart to Christ. You know that you were baptized. You know that you meant all of that. But you would say, man, from the outside looking in, people would have a hard time believing any of that. Because you so easily fall back into patterns of greed and selfishness crankiness, bitterness. And, and you know that Simon could have easily done that because you do it every day. This morning you just want to repent. And you want to cast aside whatever sin it is that has kept you from fully embracing the life of the kingdom and being blown by the Spirit of God wherever he would lead. And you want to say, man, I want to leave this place no longer living like Simon, but living like Philip. I want my life, wherever God scatters me, I want my life to be a lighthouse pointing toward the gospel. I want to live an all-in kind of life. This morning, I invite you to come and respond like Simon didn't in this passage. Maybe today you would come and make this your church home. And if you've come this morning seeking the perfect church, I can give you some numbers and addresses of other places you can try because this certainly isn't it. But somehow by His grace and mercy, the wildly unpredictable Spirit of God uses us in ways that we can't explain. And together, His kingdom is coming. I know it's true because I've seen it. You respond to his spirit, however he leads your heart as we stand and we sing together.